Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast, uh, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth conversations with thinkers, researchers, activists, policymakers, and people on the ground that try to help us better understand the metabolism of our cities and also how to reduce the environmental impact of them in a socially just and context-specific way. On today's episodes, I want to switch gears a bit and leave theory for a moment uh, and come back down to earth. Pun intended. Uh, okay, <laughs> bad pun aside. Uh, today I want to focus on a great initiative uh, based in Brussels that transforms excavated earth uh, of construction sites into building materials. As such, they use probably one of the biggest waste of flows of cities, uh, which is by the way a local resource, and reduce the need for new construction materials that are often imported in our case of our cities. To let us know more about these fascinating initiatives, I have um, Anton Martens, uh, the business developer of BC Materials. And with all that being said, Anton, welcome to the podcast. And could you perhaps uh, introduce a bit yourself and what BC Material does? Hi, uh, Aristide. Thank you for having us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier to you, it's a real honor to be here at this, uh, at this podcast because uh, we have a, we've had a lot of uh, interesting insights uh, by you and the guests that you have. So BC Materials is a, is a, a startup. It's actually a spin-off of BC Architects. And BC Architects started around 10 years ago when a small group of architects, four young architects, went to Burundi to build a library and uh, at the spot they noticed that um, the spot was so isolated. Muyinga is a sm very small village uh, in, in Burundi, which is a very big country, and uh, it would be practically impossible to import traditional materials like big bricks or uh, concrete. And um, yeah, if you wouldn't want to make the bricks yourself, you would have to cut down the trees, which was uh, very dangerous because it's, it's, it would be dangerous for the locals, for biodiversity, for the whole agriculture. And so they decided to think about what the local possibilities were. And there was an entrepreneur who explained to them that you can actually build with raw earth. And that was the big revelation that you can compress earth blocks and that you can build a construction with that and so the library in Burundi was built with the uh, with excavated earth on the spot actually just dug out and it was a real revelation and then in Brussels when when when, when, when the group came back um, we saw all the excavated earth here on site that was not used and we noticed that in fact People had been building like that for centuries, but it was just never learned in, in architecture school. So on that time, it was a revelation and it was started to be integrated into BC Architects projects, just specific architectural projects, but with earth locally excavated or close by. But because we wanted to nudge the market a bit more, it's really like you want to tickle the market. You see that construction sector is super polluting, 40% uh, of, uh, of CO2 emissions, a third of, of, uh, of, of, of waste streams, maybe a third of air pollution too, which is, which is a big issue, especially because of Corona. So we, we wanted to push the market a bit more. And then we said like, what if we ex use the excavated earth that we see every day here in Brussels? In Brussels alone, it's, it's 2 million tons that is excavated every year. What if we use that earth to, to, to make building materials and we actually try to sell them? Huh? Mm -hmm. It was like a bit of a crazy idea, especially because you have to have the infrastructure, the, the tools, uh, you have to make the products, obviously, like a kind of finished basic material, like, like a plaster or a compressed earth block and, and a round dirt. And yeah, we're now three years further and we can definitely say there is a, a growing market for it because people are attracted to the fact that you have a local material, that you have a healthy material and a circular material. So it, it, is, it, is, it is only one startup that is doing this in Belgium, but it is, it, it's showing what is possible with the metabolism of the city. And could you walk us through uh, this whole, because you said, I mean, of course, it's not a, you know, going from uh, an anecdotic or let's say small architectural experiments, uh, which we could do a number of small libraries, let's say in, in, in Belgium or in Brussels to actually becoming a manufacturer yourself. 
uh, there are so many moving pieces I can imagine. Could you? Yeah. So are you the ones that are getting the excavated soil, or can you walk us through this this process and how this works? Yeah, good question because it, it it can be quite complicated, and in that sense, it kind of starts when somebody else starts to build. So usually the 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 the, the floor has to be uh, uniformized or or earth has to be excavated for a parking, for a garage, for a cave, something like that. Especially in Brussels with a lot of construction going on, there's a lot of earth going in and out. Nowadays, usually about 70% of that earth goes to Walloon or to Flanders, where it's usually a bit like dumped in, in quarries and mines. Now they've already have some difficulty of getting rid of the earth because there's so much being being excavated amongst others with the Osterville connection, mm -hmm. but it is a problem. So the, the, the flux is so big that it's considered as a waste. For us, it's not really a waste. Officially, it is a waste. And so we see that the transporters, they have to drive pretty far to get rid of the earth. We can tell them, but we can actually use that earth. So you don't have to drive that far. So for them, it's a cost less. So we take up the earth that is tested, unpolluted, and mm. in good quality, virgin quality, actually. And we can start transforming it at our sites at BC Materials, where we have the different streams that arrive and that we have the right tools and the right infrastructure to mix it. That's one way of working. We can also work on the spot, but then we have to do more tests where we actually use the excavated earth fresh from the spot and, and, and directly into, into the materials. The nice thing about producing this way is that everything you do can be electrified. Even the water that you use, you can use rainwater. It's, it's a very low tech approach, but you have to have the knowledge of the mixes, how you make a clay plaster, how you make ram dirt. And that is very important, especially because it, it, it has been a tradition for uh, centuries, but we've just lost it over the last century with the industrial era which brought good things, but also a lot of bad things, amongst which forgetting uh, traditional techniques. And it's a bit funny eh? because, I mean, we, we, we both uh, know Brussels a bit. The Sablon, which is like a, a bit of a posh neighborhood in Brussels, well, it's called Sablon for a reason, because they're used to, they used to excavate sable, sand, from the, from the spot with which the rest of the buildings in the neighborhood were built. And it's the same thing for the mm. uh, city hall of, of Saint-Gilles that used to be a, a quarry where uh, sand was excavated. And I think that's a bit interesting about what we do is that we don't always know that within our city, there are the tools, there are the resources to build because we used, we, we, we've started to think that a city is a place where you consume, where you go to concerts, where you have uh, stuff going on, recreations, uh, people are entertained, there are services, banks, but you can actually produce in the city with the materials that are present and do a kind of urban mining, use the earth from the spot to integrate it in construction sites on the spot. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, it's such a, you know, a, a evident idea once you present it that way, right? I mean, uh, why would should we or or would we actually take out valuable and pr precious materials and just put a stamp of waste on it and then take it out of your city and then have to drive I don't know a couple of hundreds or one hundred kilometers away of your city and then dump it? Do so. I can imagine that takes off a lot of um, the steps because it's. In any case, the, the waste transporter that needs to do the tests, that needs to transport everything, and you already buy off from, let's say, the clean uh, earth, yep. and then only you, you work on that locally on your site, or you go to... Uh, because when you go on the sites, I can imagine you have to do the test. It's not done... Well, it, it's usually the building clients on the spot that yeah. have to do the test because he orders the excavations and then the then based on the tests and the test results, the excavator can decide this is earth that is polluted. There's also polluted earth in, in, in Brussels and the industrial zones, for example. But mostly, especially when it comes from very deep, it's just unpolluted and you, you mm. notice it immediately by the tests that it's uh, that it's useful. And in that sense, we've been maybe in the past two a bit. It's the same thing with secondhand materials. And secondhand materials are considered low grade that you shouldn't really buy, low quality. 
and yeah, it's it's a bit part of our economic system is that is that we've thought a lot about um, maximizing profit and 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 just selling. And to maximize profit, you actually have to offer something new to a person every year or something like that. And in that sense, the the, the approach, the circular approach and the donut approach that has also been talked about this in this podcast is another way of thinking about the, the, the materials that you create and that you reuse. So I'm wondering, um, you know, the, the, so we, we also had some, uh, some other people on the podcast that kind of reuse local materials of Brussels, such as Rotor with, as you say, secondhand construction materials, uh, or Stefan from Sonia and Woodcop and all of that. Um, do, do you think that th there, there was, um, an awareness stage that you, or you still, uh, need to, to raise awareness to your clients to, to the, let's say the, the clients that build, uh, buildings and build homes about what are the benefits of using your materials. So you, you mentioned in your materials, um, plaster and, uh, and, and bricks. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So do, do they already get it a hundred percent? So from the experience of Stefan, they kind of get it a hundred percent, like, you know, wood from the forest, uh, it is local, all, you know, the story kind of sells the, the products for itself. In your case, do you feel that it's also the same case? It's very easy for people to understand the, the value of using earth in their projects. We, we, we have a lot of similarities and, and we know each other well. And I think that's, that's one of the points where we differ in the sense that, that earth building is really close, had, had, has been close to non-existent in Belgium. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very rare that people still, or, or it used to be very rare that people uh, constructed in earth. And in that sense, um, you have a kind of a group, a segment of people that is very ecologically minded, that uh, wants to build in a sustainable way, and that is very quickly convinced of the assets once you mention it, the fact that it's circular, the fact that it's ecological, the fact that it's good for air quality inside, uh, the fact that it's acoustically better. It, it only has advantages. That group is, is, is quite quickly convinced. Uh, there is an even smaller group of people that knows earth building and knows that uh, that there are materials uh, from a classic quarry that can be produced from that but that we use we go even further by using what is officially considered as waste but then you have the giant giant majority <laughs> that doesn't know earth building and once you talk to them and you present your case with the assets that you trigger them and and we are doing that as we speak, uh, we've been doing it the last year. We first try to convince a bit of people who have already were ecologically minded and already worked with clay plaster. Uh, and, and, and just earth building in say is still a bit, we have to be honest, it's still a bit uh, thought of as something that you do in Africa or in Asia, but that is for a majority of the people not so common in Belgium, even though Bokrek is a very known example. And we are just updating and innovating in, in applying the materials in a, dare I say it, a kind of sexy contemporary way, or we're trying to at least to, to do that. So I think in, in some cases, people come in here and they say, I want a rounded wall without knowing anything about the circular or the ecological aspects of it, just because they think it's very, it's very cool and it looks very cool. And mm -hmm. for me, that's that's just as fine. And then we <laughs> explain them a bit about about the origin story and what we do, and they like it even more. But there are different ways of, of approaching it, and and in that sense, we'll 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 we'll, we'll try to use every asset that earth building has to convince people. And did you have a, any case where it was actually the the client that excavated the soil that used the soil within their own building? Um, yeah. Yep. There are there are people who really uh, go all the way or all the way the last mile you can say, and 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 really ask for the test and on and and uh, yeah really mix the materials on the spot. For them, it's a bit more expensive because we've now kind of standardized our approach in the sense that we have the materials from Brussels that we know the best and that we mm. can produce to a ninety nine percent liking of the of the former material. 
And every time you do a new chantier or a new construction site where you dig up excavated dirt on the spot in a specific site, you have to kind of fine tune it again based on the spot. But there are people who, who really go towards this trajectory and, and who love the fact that, yeah, you cannot go more local than, than this when you when you start excavating earth on the spot. And we and it's also a bit a nice part about about um, our tools and our infrastructure that they are mobile and our people are smart and 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 um, and, and expert. Uh, they have a lot of expertise, so they can judge if earth is usable on the spot and if we can and if we can transform it. We do have to do some tests, obviously. It's, it's just logical towards them, towards the clients too, to be sure that this is a good material that you can use. But it is it is a possibility. It's a minority of the cases. Eh? We have to mm. immediately add that, but it's, 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 it's definitely a possibility. And it's actually the way that people used to build. Eh? Mm. So I'm, I'm wondering, um, what are some of the, the use cases? Because once you have the, the, the bricks and the plaster, what is the typical use of the plaster? I can imagine it's for inside walls very frequently. The the bricks is it for inside walls as well? Do you can you use it for any structural case? What is kind of the yeah the, the main case cases or use cases for for yeah. your materials? Good good question. Uh, the, the plasters are clay plasters are, are are sensible to humidity, so they can only be used in the inside. They can be used in bathrooms and kitchens too, if they're not in direct contact with uh, mm. with, with water. Uh, the blocks can be used as walls or, or, or parts of walls uh, on a structural level from ground floor plus two floors. So you can then go in infinity 10 floors or 15 floors with, with compressed earth blocks. And then you have rammed earth, which is a bit uh, uh, the queen of, of earth building in the sense of it's a, it's a mixture of, of gravel, clay, and sand, and it kind of offers you the possibility to go in a lot of directions. You can do a floor with ram dirt, you can do design pieces with ram dirt, you can do walls with ram dirt, you can go very high with uh, ram dirt, 15 meters even. We, we once constructed a wall like that, but uh, it is a fact that ram dirt is very intensive. It's a bit like concrete, but in contrast to concrete, you have to ram it. You literally have to put force into it. And so the more high you go and the thicker your walls need to be, mm. the more effort and the more intensive it becomes and the more expensive it obviously becomes for, for the contractor, for him to, to decide how much uh, days he will have to spend on, on the material. So there are a lot of possibilities. And for example, ram dirt can also be used externally. You can, you can use it as a kind of external facade. You cover it a bit more, but it's a bit more resistant to humidity than, than for example, clay plaster. And do you have an idea of the, the quantities that you manage to save up uh, from you know, going to waste that you reuse into materials? Well, for example, I think this year, I'm not sure, uh, obviously the year is not finished yet, but I yeah. think we're going to clock at, uh, at about 600 tons, of which the, the large majority, I would say 85 up to 90% will probably be excavated earth. So it is, it is substantial. But one also has to admit that I mean we're super happy with uh, not going to uh, not going to to dish it or something like that. But uh, we have to admit that uh, in, with regard to the flux of mm -hmm. the stream of earth, it's still little. And with regard to other bigger players in the construction sector, it's not that big. But it's really for us. We wanted to show that it was possible. And now, when we found it, when 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 it was founded, it was really 2000, uh, end of 2018 and 2019. We we launched the products. We wanted to show that it was possible, and now we've shown that it's more than possible, but it's really viable, and that it's uh, it, that it that it's a good approach, and that's really what 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 kind of drives us now. And so, how do you see the? Um... I mean, so now we're talking about 600 tons and you said, what was it? Two, two million tons. So we're talking about 0.1% uh, or 0.01% or something like that. Yeah. That leaves, of course, the room for such, you know, such an important uh, production. Uh, of course, 
out of um, the construction materials that we use, not all of it can be satisfied by 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 your materials. Um, but of course, that leaves like a huge margin to to grow. Is is that the idea, or how do you perceive as well the you know the the, the, well, the I, future I, of such a, yeah. of activities? Yeah, good question. I, I don't think we'll ever tap into the full <laughs> possibilities. Yeah. And and I think about half of the materials or half of the two million could be could be reused. We're, I don't think we're ever going to get there, but I do see that there could be a very bright future for construction and building, especially within the city, but also with the periphery combined, is that you, there are today fantastic possibilities to decarbonize your materials, to use structurally wood as the strong point within your, 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 your material, to use secondhand materials, for example, tiles in your bathroom, uh, to, to, to be water resistant and to combine that with a good quality energy water pump, uh, uh, solar pump and solar panels. And you have the building that is as close as you can get to, to being carbon neutral as, as is possible. So you have the finished, we have the, there's a house in, in Molenbeek that I, I really like um, by Hanna Ekelmans and it's, it's actually like an extension with um, straw bales um wooden structure clay plaster and uh hempcrete so a mix of of hemp and uh and and, and uh, lime and it's really probably the closest that you can get today to, to 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 carbon neutral building with a very good quality and with a very healthy approach and it's really i think these kind of uh examples should be upscaled and really kind of um augmented at, 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 at the kind of city level where you can see that it is possible if the, if the architect is really Im immensely persevering and really wants to find the right kind of material for, for the tool. But it's, it's, it's that kind of approach that we will need in the future. And, and as you mentioned, earth materials will not solve ev everything. Uh, they will not do uh, insulation, for example, or, or hard materials that are necessary in, in, in the bathroom. Um, but they, they, they are an important part of the mix. And the mix is there with the bio-based insulation, the secondhand materials, wood and reused steel, for example. Um, so you said also the, the important role of, first of all, the, the creativity and the persistence of, uh, of architects uh, and of the client to want this type of project as a demonstrator, as something that they want to, as an agenda perhaps that they want uh, to, to push uh, forward. Um, so because uh, BC Materials, Rotor, a number of other actors are actually coming from the architectural world, how do you feel that, you know, this type of approaches are, are or are not taught or are and are not as uh, attractive to to new architects, to common architecture? Uh, do they need to relearn uh, many things in order to use these type of materials? Uh, how do you see this, uh, this kind of future of, you know, the constructive practices? Uh, good, good question, but a tough issue because I've, I've, I've met students who were in their last year of master and who said that, like, yeah, we, we didn't get any class on, on sustainable material use or not on, on a material level. And for me, it's still a bit of a shock that in 2021 that that still happens. But we have to admit that there is a very big openness at a lot of universities to, uh, to mix the practices with the theory by really touching the materials uh, doing workshops with the Rotor, with Sony and Wood Company, with us too, uh, to really get into in, in, into the material side of the of the issue, and I think um, the openness has been much bigger, and and I think in general in society it is a bit pushed forward by the Green Deal, that made it very clear on a European level that we as a society think that we should be CO two neutral by two thousand fifty. And there is no escaping it, not even for construction, because if you look at the financial part, a person who drives a diesel car, he will pay more taxes on his CO2 emissions proportionally 
than a, a concrete producer because the concrete producers are exempt from from co2 uh, emission rights that they, they get the rights to pollute and to because they are deemed a bit essential which is yeah maybe partially true but very partially and so uh, we are we are seeing that in every sector they have to make their accounts they have to check like hmm, what are we all doing how do we produce this how do we approach this and the construction sector cannot escape this because at some point at transport they will say but why do we all, all have to do the efforts <laughs> those guys in the construction sector are just uh, burning coals, uh, burning fossil fuel to produce whatever they want. And they have an emission grade of 40%. It's really insane. We're not going to go forward. So we're all now in the same boat with the sectors. And in that sense, it's pushing the construction sector to rethink its habits. And it's seeping through. And I think in some universities, they're really leading on this, uh, that, that we have to ask the question like, what are we going to do with our material and how are we going to use it, including the transport? How far do we look for it? Uh, how expensive does it have to be? And yeah, that will also be a big part of the, of the issue. Can we do an affordable, circular, sustainable house for the average Joe in, in, in our countries? And can we, can we build that? And, and how cheap or how acceptable should it be? It's it's really I think for some architects it's it's um, it's it's sad that that they hadn't haven't gotten that education when they starting now because these questions are everywhere mm. in the public tenders circular criteria will become more and more important if you don't uh, have the tools to uh, to approach that it's, it's much more difficult. Yeah, I I really see that as well. The how how ill equipped um and not necessarily because they don't want to but because no, you know yeah, yeah it, it feels like uh, they're completely overwhelmed with you know the in embodied emissions the embodied uh, energy the the circularity of it how do i grade between two different circularities how do i make sure the technical capabilities of it so i, I feel there's just so, so much on on their shoulders and at the same time it's great that public administrations are pushing towards let's say circularity but there is like this huge gap this huge divide between you know people like you that you try to experiment and you you have everything the stacks against you and at the same time you know that the mainstream architect that has absolutely no idea of what you're talking about and absolutely no idea how to pitch this to their own client yeah you know, so. yeah it's it's a it's a it's, it's a game of gaps and, and the gaps have to be transcended and if you look in the past yeah in the 50s and the 60s it, it was probably a bit of a dream period for an architect because you could practically construct whatever you want wherever you want it with whatever materials you wanted and now yeah, you have the EPB for sure you have to you have, you have so many constraints in that that um, I think it's probably difficult to juggle all of these, and and our approach is a bit that you go towards a low tech approach where you um, I'm 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 trying to remember the philosopher who said that yeah, the easy solution sometimes is the best is that is that the most straightforward solution is sometimes the best in energy dosing too in how much energy do you have to need do you need within within a building in that sense i think that that can be a valid tool to work your way through the labyrinth of norming and and, and rules within construction because uh, otherwise like you mentioned it, it will be quite a burden for for a lot of uh, young architects to, to to find their way through that uh, to that to that uh, labyrinth Although, unfortunately, today, the common sense is not what rules neither the construction sector nor, you know, how we how the, the price reflects to, to things. If we see that construction materials, new construction materials cost less than we use construction materials. I don't know also how you position in terms of, of price. I don't know if, if you also face challenges in terms of price compared to new materials. Uh, also, this does not make sense, but still, you know, that that's how it is today you're you're really hitting the nail here because it's 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 really the main point to make to every policy maker today is that we have to start pricing the externalities of, of how we produce how we work 
I think this week it was uh, in, in the newspaper that Nike, uh, the, 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 the brand, uh, shredded their shoes, their new shoes, to avoid them having to offer them again, to, to have the logistics, to have to pay for the logistics, or God beware that, we, that you would have to show them at, at reduced prices. This is the crazy world that we're in. And, 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 and for example, the concrete producer that I mentioned too, if we continue to say like they have exemptions to produce, you, you create an, a very, very unequal level playing field where some get a lot of advantages and, and others none. I think for us, I, I don't want to complain too much about the price because I think our price is, is quite reasonable and we are close to, to market price. We're a bit more expensive in the sense that contractors with which we work, they ask their price and um, due to experience and the fact there are not that many contractors that work with earth building, the mm -hmm. total price for 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 an application of, of, of clay plasters or, or ram dirt can be higher. It, that is true, especially ram dirt is a lot higher because it is a very specific product and it has to be made in a very specific way. But I mean, if you look at the insulation level too, I think in Belgium, Practically ninety percent of the of the market is within the hands of of, of Bursch or equally um, made, equally produced, uh, similarly made produced uh, materials. If we don't change that fiscally, that the externalities are counted into, we will continue to have this problem, and it will be it it will have to this will have to change. I mean. I think we, 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 we can have a good market amongst people who are ecologically convinced and who can, and who can pay for, for, for the materials that we make. But if you really want to change the whole of society and the way that we build in the future, it will have to be mainstreamed that you pay for the externalities as a producer. And the producer either will have to charge it to his clients or we, he will have to yeah, do it in another way. In that sense, it's it's quite positive that the CO2 price per ton has has quadrupled. I think it gone from 15 euros to to 60 euros this year. Um, yeah, it's 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 rude to say maybe, but I mean it will have to go higher. It will have to go towards 100 euros, because with the carbon budget that we have left for the rest for the 30 years that are coming, um, it will have to become higher. And and um, every every mean that you kind of um, uh, get out of that system, a part of it should be redistributed for socially just and equal uh, initiatives. For example, social housing that can be renovated, uh, CLT project, community land trust project, and that you really do the effort towards uh, those who are less privileged to not make them pay the price. But it's, it's, it's a, also for policymakers, it's a lot of... Um, loops to to jump through and and that is that is quite the effort but it's it's a certainty that we cannot accept that that the externalities go so unpunished and that they go so un, unpaid for as they are now so i'm wondering uh you know uh brussels flanders now wallonia as well have have or had ambitious circular economy programs uh within them they also had uh, you know, call for projects where they funded numerous uh, initiatives. I think you were part of the Be Circular uh, initiatives, I don't know, once or twice. Um, do you feel that it really brings any support, at least to, to feel part of, of, of such a, a community and feel more or less reassured that the, 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 the policy slash the, the, the government has a has a will into this or you know yep. it's nice to get the the extra cash but at the end of the day that doesn't change much well i mean what you mentioned is important in the sense that um you have to have these starting uh, subsidies for example the infrastructure that we have was partly built with the b circular uh, mm. uh, price and it is necessary because you cannot otherwise you cannot even start because the construction sector is so big and hegemonic in the sense that the big giants that have the best that have very tight margins but large volumes they they make a lot of cash and and so in that sense they, they their their system is hard to disrupt 
because they have a constant flow, they have the clients and all. So it is very important that the government subsidizes um, the new initiatives in general, because innovation is, is, is important. And I think most of all in construction where the innovation is sometimes really low, but in, in it, it, the, the government is sometimes like the seven headed beast where one where one minister does this and the other does that or where the other minister cannot change what has happened because the minister before him promised the sector that that wouldn't happen and in that sense uh, I, I don't judge any specific uh, ministers but it is a fact that the externalities if they are not calculated integrate into the price we will still be fighting uh, goliath and and maybe maybe we will win but um, it's, it's the same thing for, for other players too, is that if you, if you work in such a linear system, our, most of our fiscal system is still linear. Mm. While you're trying to push a circular initiative, it's, yeah, the odds are against you. And, and we shouldn't mince words about that. In that sense, I think it's really great in Brussels that you have this ecosystem, but on a, a, a wider federal and, and European level, things have to change on a fiscal level so that these uh, kind of initiatives and we're not talking just about us but but for example rotor has the same problem too in the sense that their second hand tiles are sometimes more expensive than the indian tiles that you can import really easily in that sense we we'll, we have to change the system and not only the the the, the specific subsidies for for x or for y um so yeah i can imagine that through this um ecosystem you have probably um, heard similar stories or similar challenges we're all fighting i guess to to have a storage space or common equipment or sometimes skills because you know i mean i can imagine that you getting the skills to know what is the right mix of of soil and earth to mix together uh, it is you know I mean it's a lot to learn and you need to learn it from experimentation from I guess uh, uh, experiment and fail. Um, do, do you feel that uh, there is something useful in, in, in or that there is something that exists to upscale a bit you know all of these initial uh, experimentations and then make them a bit more structural except of course you know the I, I hear the, the the argument for f fiscality and for the right price, which I think it's of course uh, one of the essential barriers. But I, I also feel that there is also a barrier of space, of uh, being equipped and, and being skilled. Do you feel that these are uh, these will exist, or this this is difficult? This is uh, this is something that is getting better. What, what are your your insights about this? Yeah, um, tough question in the sense that uh, I, I don't know if you know Jan Jonker, he's a professor, a Dutch mm -hmm. professor on, on, on circular economy and initiatives. And I think in, in one of his studies, he, he analyzed that a lot of circular startups uh, die after after within the, the scale of five years. So the, 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 the space issue, the market issue is, is, is quite a factor in that. And in that sense, I think within the city, it's always the question, we, we really love the city. We think it is our urban mind. We get inspired by it. We think that the market is also here because uh, cities have to renovate uh, a lot of their housing, a lot of their uh, uh, real estate. And so it's logical to be here, but at the same time, the price of, of real estate here is also much higher. And so you pay more per square meter. What I think is a really good uh, approach is that you kind of combine and that you look for synergies within uh, different companies to share spaces like the Fab Labs do or to, 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 to kind of uh, compartmentalize certain spaces and that you win in that department. And then the infrastructure, you always have to ask yourself, like, what do I really need? What I'm, what I'm, what I'm going to maximize? And... Uh, we have the advantage of having a pretty low tech uh, approach. And in that sense, uh, in Sweden, for example, there's one of the biggest cement producers in, in the country. I think they have about 60% uh, rate of the market. They had their environmental permit uh, revoked this year. 
and the whole country was uh <laughs> yeah was was like crushing it was a it was really strange because the, there were like people saying you cannot do this and then the, the judge said but you're you're trespassing several limits of what you do and you've been warned and you haven't done anything to remediate it and then you could see a bit in the reactions of the of the of the of the plant that they said but were too important you know you cannot do this and so in that sense uh, the the easier the way you you make your materials or the less you need the more easy you make it for yourself too and making it possible within the city to find a place and 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 and, and, and an infrastructure if you burn fossil fuels you you have a tougher uh, environmental permit than if you don't burn fossil fuels so that's a bit uh, my suggestion, but there's a lot of other answers to this too, in the sense that, yeah, that infrastructure is still hefty, that you have to have kind of pre-financing um, and that yeah, on the other side of the road where the traditional producers are, they've already amortized their infrastructure and it's, it's still polluting, but yeah, but they have their clients, they have their infrastructure. In that sense, it, 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 the odds are are, 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 are are uneven divided and it, it's, a, it's a continuous fight. And yeah, I mean, as you say, we, we can imagine a country being, you know, incapable of, of constructing just because there is one plant that is going down. We see that the resilience as well, how unresilient it is based on, you know, be, well, still, I guess, concrete is or cement is relatively easy to, to be made, is relatively locally sourced uh, a number of times. Uh, still, you need to burn a number of things though to do it. So yeah, it it, it, it also shows how how we're not prepared to, to, to face these type of, you know, hegemonic uh, structures. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, there is one question. Uh, uh, we discussed before as well, but um, which was, let's say that the, when I discussed with uh, Stefan on the wood uh, cooperative, you know, back in the day, we, we had, we, we had the information that wood came uh, or what was the amount of wood that existed in Brussels and how much of it was actually exported to Asian markets. Um, and that kind of made theoretically at least uh, a, a perfect idea or a perfect uh, case for creating a company or a cooperative the same i guess for for bc materials there is a theoretical uh excellent initiative but someone needs to do it at the end of the day and there we kind of saw the the limits of research and the 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 needs of practice um and i'm wondering you know do how do you is there any uh, exchange that that you usually do with research? How do, is that helpful? Do you use uh, useful um, insights from research and also vice versa? I can imagine that researchers comes now to you to to understand what you have produced and what is the potential of what you have done. Well, I mean, uh, it, it's really good that you question that you make that question because we use your studies too to estimate, for example, the amount of of, uh, of bricks and, and and plaster used in 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 in, um, in, in Brussels and 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 discharged of. And for us, it's it's really a constant interaction with with researchers. Some of us uh, are inspired by the researchers and and by the builder themselves. And at the same time, we give some inspiration, or I hope, to to other researchers who, who are asking questions about LCAs in, in our in our materials, and others. And I really think uh, there's an interesting flow of, of research coming out that is that is pushed amongst others by the ETH, uh, by the VUB, mm -hmm. by the ULB, that that is really hitting the nail on, on, on some departments and that are showing the perspectives that are possible within our country, within Europe, for a much cleaner and healthier building than, than we're doing right now. So, so it is really, uh, really super interesting to see what happens. And if we can mention like a builder, not an architect, but yeah, I mean, Martin Rauch is very known uh, for, for Ram Dirt buildings. And it's it's really he he turned it into something sexy that that a lot of people had not considered uh, thinking about, or, or or looking at, 
and it's really yeah those kind of figures are, are, are sometimes underestimated because not for every student in architecture school uh, Martin Rauch is a name as Norman Foster is for example <laughs> yeah um, so I don't know whether I can imagine that you have a different way of seeing the city now um, seeing you know what what is around you as a as a resource i guess your your job has made you a a, a different uh, person now do, do you see is there anything that you see uh, in the city that tells you oh this we should absolutely reuse in some way or another a particular flow that you see that it's, that seems so undervalued so so much underused uh, and yet nothing exists it is it is uh, for me um, I'll, I'll maybe give two examples, if I may. It's it's the, the city hall of Saint Gilles, where where there used to be a quarry. It's it's so difficult to imagine because it's a really beautiful neighborhood, and that yeah, that the quarry was actually there on the spot where this <laughs> hall is now, and the houses were built with. So sometimes you really you are walking on 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 the ingredients of of what is what is built around you. And a second thing, especially in Brussels, but it's it's also always a bit confrontational if you go to Italy or to other southern countries. The roofs are used as a space. Mm. And I mean, here in Belgium and in Brussels, you have some examples, but you see a lot of black black roofing that is just not not used and underused. And it's so it's such a valuable space. We always say that the space is so valuable, but if you see the roofing, it's it's underused and it's underappreciated and 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 for some of the BC architects projects we're also working on that of really um, valorizing the roofs and 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 the spaces and the views that it gives and and the possibilities that it offers. I think especially from a circular point of view, we have to maximize the the space that we have and and, and use it to 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 public good. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I I often have also these, you know, the the. I always wonder, you know, single flows is that. So we discussed about uh, the the pavement or, you know, the the cobblestones. That could be something interesting. You could have a specific, I don't know, the the, the copper of uh, of wires. Your your mind starts to wonder, and of course, this is so relative to to price, right? I mean, how we how, how expensive and how valuable our resource is. And so every time I, I do this exercise of well, of course, I mean, you know, in, in our in our exercises, we kind of see what comes in, what goes out. And what goes out, we have an idea of the sink today. We know how much uh, carbon we have still left to, to stay within the 1.5, 2 degrees. On the inside, uh, we know that we have less and less materials, but at the same time, we could always have more if we substitute or if we dig deeper with lesser concentrations and with more energy. So, you know, sometimes we, we see perhaps the sink as being the limiting factor. So the CO2 emissions rather than what we have in front of us. But yeah, these are can you, absolutely yeah. the, the general questions I always put in my mind. I don't know how to, to answer them. <laughs> I think I think what, but it's also a bit of communication. Eh? Sometimes the, the the talks about climate change and and, and the challenges of, of construction are super depressing. I mean, we, we have to admit it is that you see that it's not going fast enough. You see in general that that we are counting on negative offsetting, and it's <laughs> it's crazy to see the the kind of calculation that we make to kind of make it match with, with one point <laughs> five. But on the other side, you could also say that there is a very positive uh, future potentially lying ahead of us where we're really reappreciating the stuff that is already here, the tools mm -hmm. that are already here, that we have all this production capacity, but that we're just not using it in a very, very uh, clean way. And that there is a future ahead of us that, that will be healthier and that there will be less air pollution and that there will be more material use and less of a dump than than we than than you see at a professional container park right now. I mean, it's a super depressing place, but there there are the the, 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 the tools to, to kind of um, in that sense. What I mentioned with the the, the exemplary building in Molenbeek, it's it's really that what I think that we should try to scale is that mm -hmm. kind of approach, that kind of thinking, which is not obvious. Eh? It's not it's not uh, it's not easy. But it is possible, and, and, and that's really what we should be aiming for.
yeah, as organic agriculture, I don't think that agriculture was such a ripe, uh, you know, sector to innovate as well beforehand. And still, I mean, now it's it's normal to find in all supermarkets organic food, yeah. which which wasn't the case like ten years ago. So I, I don't think that's a a big issue. Is it's just a matter of habit, I guess. I, I don't know. Um, so I'm wondering. What are some of the, your plans for 2022? I think I read somewhere that perhaps you're wondering of exporting your your model to to other places. Well, do you see BC Materials being in each European capital and and doing the same thing? We're we're, we're having a, a a big plan or project where we we want to aim for reusing the excavated earth of the subway tree line in Brussels. And transform it into materials that could actually be used for certain construction projects. Um, we think it has a lot of potential, and we don't necessarily want a department of BC in in every European country. <laughs> but we think it would be great if the method would be there in every mm -hmm. in every big city. In I mean, Amsterdam, for example, has has also a very donut uh, policy. They want to reuse much more what they already have. They also did the subway line a few years ago, but there is so many earths moving in, in the cities that is not used, is that the potential is there. And it's not only here in Brussels, it's not that our, our earth is so much more special than elsewhere. So we, we, we do uh, sometimes export our expertise to, to different cities. And we have some projects going on of which some are already confirmed and some not. But for example, with the subway project, uh, Belleris uh, signed a kind of a letter of intent. They're really enthusiastic about the ID, but we'll see how it, how it will work out. But I mean, if we can export the IDs and export from time to time a project where we say like, we can do this with local earth because we're not planning to export the Brussels earth would be <laughs> um, Then I think we, we, but I mean, even now we, we already have super interesting projects coming up in, in 2022 and we don't want to grow to grow, but it would be wonderful if, if a lot of other cities take up the ID and, and start reusing the materials that they have. Uh, perhaps a, a last question we generally ask is, uh, do you have any recommendations for, for, you know, more inspiration either about the topic or something that you saw recently, read recently, and that was super impactful to you and you would like to share with us? Well, I would definitely recommend the, the listeners to, to continue listening to this podcast, which is very inspiring. Um, for me, I really try to focus a bit on, on the positive things that are happening in general, because it's, it, it's sometimes it's a bit of a hurricane of uh, bad news. Uh, and it's just that you have to focus on the, on the real stuff that you're doing and the, the, the inspiring projects that, that, you, that there are present. For example, like the project that I mentioned in Molenbeek and, and, and a lot of others. Um, I'm not really thinking about any medium for the moment, but you have some media and some people, influencers, who post a lot on climate positive news in the sense that they say, like, well, we, we're facing a really tough battle, but this is what happened in the world that is positive towards, uh, towards the climate. And I think in that sense, and I hope that... For example, with the whole coal discussion and, and energy discussion, is that at some point the, the mechanical breakthrough of renewable energy will be so big and it will be at such a low cost. The, the development there is, is, as I think, is quite comforting, is that it is replacing in a lot of countries the standard way of, 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 of heating uh, spaces or cooking stuff. Uh, just by, 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 for example, solar mirrors, which is a really cool concept. Uh, I, I saw a video on it recently, and people are just cooking with, with a combination of, 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 of mirrors, actually. And it's really, it's, it's so low tech and cool that, that you're like, wow. I mean, we are still on gas. We are still cooking on gas in Belgium, like most people. And in other places, you can do it in a much cleverer by using the 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 the, the natural heat that that has been given to us by Mother Sun, you know. So there, there's a lot and a lot of interesting and positive initiatives going on. And sometimes you have to feed into that, and mm -hmm. and sometimes you're energized by the bad stuff that's happening. And I think that's a bit the mix that you have to look for. Well, thanks so much, Anton. I hope uh, next time we we meet, you're gonna. 
you're gonna tell me more exciting news about new projects and new uh, success stories thanks so much uh, Anton and thanks everyone as well to listening until the end um, I hope you liked uh, this video please do share it with people that are curious about using low take approaches in the construction sector uh, and uh, we'll see you in two weeks for another conversation thanks a lot everyone